for coming out tonight. Thank you for neglecting your mothers at home and coming to hear me speak instead. Um, for those of you who haven't met me, I'm sure everyone's met me by now. <coughs> My name's Matthew, uh, and like Chris said, this is the third week in our five-week series called Little Books Speak God. Hope everyone's had a good Mother's Day. This is an aside. My Mother's Day story, I think, is going to top everybody's Mother's Day story. I was chatting to my cousin's wife, and as I was chatting to her, her waters broke. So I think that's going to win Mother's Day. She was becoming a mother on Mother's Day. <laughs> anyway, so for this series, we're looking at the five smallest books in the Bible, the one-chapter books that often ne get neglected. And we're seeing how even though these books are small, God is still big throughout the <coughs> so, so far, who did we do the first week? Philemon. Philemon, thank Philemon. you. Philemon. Philemon. Oh. Philemon. <laughs> <laughs> and that was Paul's only contribution to this series. And then, who did we do last week? Obadiah. 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 Well done. That was the only one chapter book in the Old Testament. And this week, we are looking at the shortest book in the entire Bible, and it is called Second John. Now, that title might confuse you. So before we do anything else, let me explain who wrote this book and why it's called Second John. Who is John and why is he second? Well, we know that Jesus had 12 disciples, okay? Now, the youngest of these, these disciples was a guy called John. Now, he was the only one of the disciples who wasn't murdered or martyred for his faith, although they tried. They tried boiling him in oil, and then when that didn't work, they exiled him off to an island. Now, John wrote a few books of the Bible, okay? He wrote the Gospel of John, so you guys know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He's the John. Uh, and in that gospel book, he calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved, which I guess if you're the last disciple alive, you can write that about yourself. <laughs> and we're going to refer to that gospel a fair bit tonight as well. But he also wrote a few other books in the Bible. Whilst he was exiled, after they tried to kill him, remember, uh, he had a vision. And in, in that vision, from that vision, he wrote the last book of the Bible called Revelation, which we're studying through in our Learn the Bible series. So... If you're interested in that, you're more than welcome to come along. So John wrote the Gospel of John and the Book of Revelation, but he also wrote a few letters to people, to some different people in different churches. He wrote three, actually, or well, three that we have. He probably wrote more than three letters in his life. We have three in the Bible, and we call those letters 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. Now, 1 John is too big for this series. It's five chapters long, which is way too long for us. <laughs> but 2 and 3 John are both only one chapter each. So we're doing 2 John tonight, and then, like Chris said, after the stewardship, series, we're going to come back and do third John then. Now, second John, like I said, it's the shortest book in the Bible. It's only 13 verses long, and third John isn't too far behind it. It's only 15 verses. Now, for comparison, the story of the prodigal son, that's 22 verses long. Oh, here, here I am. Uh, the birth of John the Baptist, so a different John to this John, so John the Baptist. At the start of the book of Luke, just his birth, that's given 21 verses. So you can see, this isn't a very big book at all. So you can imagine that this little book gets skipped over a fair bit. But we're going to see still that God has this letter in the Bible for a reason. And we'll unpack that tonight. Now the other question that get up, gets asked is, do we need to have studied 1 John before we study 2 John? I mean, that does make sense because 2 comes after 1. This week you're learning to count with me. <laughs> before 1, yes, thank you, whoever just fixed that. Yes. No, 2 comes after 1. Who just said before? <laughs> Someone's stuffing me up. Anyway, <laughs> the answer is no. Okay, John wrote a few letters to different groups of people in the same way that Paul did, but the way we used to distinguish John's letters is by numbers. So uh, he, first John, second John, and third John. Like the numbers don't imply a sort of successive thought that you need to have studied first John before you do second John. But that said, there are a lot of similarities between all three of his letters. Now, in all three of his letters, John is particularly concerned about false teaching. He's concerned about, like, he wants us to know that we should be loving one another. And he emphasizes that we need to walk in the knowledge of the truth. So now that we know a bit about the author, let's set up the time period because it's good to get some context. When was this book written and what was going on at that time? Okay. Now, John likely wrote this letter in AD around 90 to 95. So a fair bit after Jesus died. It's one of the latest books that we have in the Bible. And during this period of time, there was a movement that was gaining a lot of ground and it was called Gnosticism. Okay, now quick Greek lesson. Gnosis, okay, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but gnosis is the Greek word for knowledge. And the most common time we'd probably hear that word is today when someone's sort of sitting on the fence with regards to religion, we'd call them agnostic. So now an English lesson. The A prefix before a word means without. So for example, if we say something is asymmetrical, we say that it's not symmetrical, it's without symmetry. 
So an agnostic or an agnostic, as we combine it, means someone without knowledge. An agnostic would say that there is no way that you can have knowledge as to whether or not God exists. So it's around the knowledge side of things. And so that's an agnostic, someone without knowledge. A gnostic was someone who was on the other end of the spectrum. Okay? They believed that they had special knowledge that elevated them above normal people. And they would use this to deceive people. And so John is the last living disciple. And you can imagine if you'd set up all these churches and you loved all the people inside these churches and then someone comes in and they start teaching lies and deceiving people, how would you react? Most of us would rage. John wrote some letters. And so we need to read the letter in that context. And I'll come back to some of what the Gnostics were teaching later in this message. But here's what I think the main point of this message is. That knowing the truth protects you from being deceived. And nobody here wants to be deceived. We all want to live according to what is true. And John is saying that the way to do that is to love one another the way that God has loved us. And so John's really going to emphasize the importance of the truth tonight. And the way not to be deceived is to know the truth. And you'll see that word come up a lot at the start. So come with me and we'll see uh, how I got to that conclusion. I was going to sing that, but I've chickened out. So let's take the shortest trip through the Bible, okay? Well, through a book of the Bible that we can, which is 13 verses. We're going to read the entire book in one go. So I'm going to get Danae up here. Danae, if you can come up here and read the 13 verses, you can follow along either in your Bibles if you've got them or else it's going to be up on the screen as well. So thank you, Danae. Sorry, it's just a Bear with me, because my phone is very broken. It's not here as well, if you want to read off the sheet. That's probably very <laughs> The elder, to the lady chosen by God and to her children, whom I love in, tr- in the truth. And not I only, but also all who know the truth. Because of the truth which lives in, which lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace from our God the Father and Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, will be with us in truth and love. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father has commanded us. And now, dear lady, I am not writing you a new command, but one we've had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. I say this because many deceivers, who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh, have gone out into the world. Any such, de- any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house and do not welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their good work. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face, so that our joy may be complete. Children of your sister, who is chosen by God, send their greetings. Thank you, Danae. So that's an entire book of the Bible right there. Well done, everyone. So let's look at what John has to say. Now, he starts by calling himself the elder, and he's writing to the lady chosen by God and her children. Now, at first glance, we go, ooh, who is this special lady that he's writing to? Now, most scholars and most commentaries, they agree that he's actually talking to a church here. Uh, The letter was written during a time of persecution, and so using other names would have been fairly common there. And Also, at the end of the book, he refers to the children of your sister, and just the general tone of the message makes it appear that he's writing to a church. And Also, throughout the Bible, the church is often referred to in female terms, like it's called the bride of Christ and things like that. Now, we need to talk a bit about what truth is. See, John mentions it five times in the first four verses, and it's the foundation for the rest of the book. So we're going to talk a bit about truth as a concept, because for a lot of people, particularly in today's society, truth is something that we determine for ourselves. Now, who's ever had somebody say to them, well, that might be true for you, but that isn't true for me? And that way of thinking isn't really a new concept. Now, Jesus, when he was standing before the Roman governor Pilate, said, The reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me, to which Pilate responds, What is truth? What is truth? And it's an extremely important question because Jesus says that the very reason he was born and came into the world was to testify to the truth, to tell us about the truth. And it's important because what you believe to be true determines how you live your life. Now, as an example, and this is a very mild example without the implications that the text has, but who here was told when they were younger that after you'd had something to eat, you weren't allowed to swim for 30 minutes? Yep, everyone was told that. And we, to- we were told that, and so we believed it. And that truth claim determined what we did. 
And you can see why truth is such an important thing because when someone tells you that something is true, you'll base your behavior around it. We were told that we couldn't swim, so we didn't. And as soon as someone told us the actual truth, that really it didn't matter, or if nobody's told you the actual truth, it doesn't really matter, well, you're going to change your behavior, and you're going to start swimming, or in my case, you're going to start drowning. <laughs> See, what we believe to be true determines how we live our lives. And as another example, knowing the truth stops you from looking like a fool. Now, you guys know that I'm colorblind. Well, this week at work, I'm a physiotherapist, and this week at work was Heart Week, okay? And so as part of Heart Week, we focus on heart disease, and we have to wear red. And you can probably guess where this is going. Apparently, the jumper I wore wasn't exactly red, and people laughed at me. See, I believed something that was true. Well, it wasn't true. But I believed something to be true, and it wasn't, that my jumper was red. And so I look silly. See, we want to know the truth because it stops us from looking like a fool. And so everyone is always trying to find out what is true and what is not true. To expand out this out a bit further, have a bigger implication than just swimming and clothing, people want to know what the reason for life is because if they can find out what the true reason for life is, why they're here, then that will determine how they live their lives. For example, if you think that the true reason for living is to get rich, then your behavior will reflect that. You'll probably be fairly ruthless when it comes to things like money. Or if you think the true reason for living is to experience as many different things as you can, then you'll probably spend most of your time traveling, in which case that will affect things like, do you buy a house? Like What you believe to be true determines how you live your life. And this is why Jesus is the most divisive person who has ever lived, because he came into the world and he said that he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And he's saying that he is the reason for your life. And in fact, the Gospel of John starts with the verse, in the beginning was the word. Now, that probably doesn't grab us as much as it did the early Greeks. For the early Greeks, that was an absolutely mind-blowing statement. And I'll explain why. So, back to the Greek. The word that we translate as word in this sentence is the Greek word logos. In the beginning was the logos. Now, the logos, it was a Greek philosophical term. And what did it mean? Well, simply put, it meant the reason or the purpose, the meaning. And by this, I mean what is the meaning, what is the purpose, what is the reason for life? So John is saying, in the beginning was the reason for life. And the philosophers then and philosophers now are saying, well, what is the meaning? What is the logos for, the, for us? And John is saying that the reason for our lives is not something that we try and determine for ourselves, that we search for ourselves, but the reason has already been given to us. And it's been given to us in the form of a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. We find our reason for life in what he says to us, what he's done for us, and what he will do for us. And that is where we find the truth of who we really are through the persons and works of Jesus. Now, obviously, the early Christians picked this up. Okay? They liked what they were hearing, and so they lived their lives following what Jesus said. They were obeying his commandments. But like I said at the start, there was a group called the Gnostics, and they came along and they would teach extra things. Now, remember the Gnostics, they thought that they had extra knowledge. And these extra things would cause the people they were speaking to to lose sight of the truth. And people were being led astray. So I'll mention some of the things that the Gnostics were teaching, and you'll see John del deliberately pointing the people back to Jesus in this letter in contrast to these things. So as an example, the Gnostics believed that they had knowledge that no one else could ha have, that they had extra truth and that you needed the extra truth to really be a Christian. So John emphasizes to the people in this church in verse 5 that he is not giving them a new commandment, so he's not giving them new extra truth, but truth that they've had from the beginning. So can you see the response to the Gnostics there? The Gnostics wanted people to think that they had to know something new. And John wanted to point them back to the beginning and say, this is something that we've had from the start. He's saying, let's go back to the basics. Now, the Gnostics also believed that the spiritual world was all that was important and that knowledge of God was far more important than the way you lived your life, that you could sin all you wanted as long as you knew lots about God. And so in verse 6, John refutes this by saying that it is actually really important the way in which we live our lives, that we walk in obedience to what Jesus said, that we love one another, that it is important how we live our lives. It can't just be facts inside our head. And this is a theme throughout the Bible, like Jesus' brother James wrote a letter, and in that letter he said that faith without deeds is a dead faith that you need to be focused on how you live your life as well. And there's this American pastor, his name's Francis Chan, and he has this great illustration where he talks about how crazy it would be if he went up to his daughter and he asked his daughter to clean her room. 
And then he came back a couple of hours later and saw that the room wasn't clean, so he went up and he chatted to his daughter, and his daughter responds, well, we heard what you said, and we got a group together, and we studied what you said. We even looked up what it meant in the Greek to clean our room, and we all agreed by what you, on what you meant by that statement. And Francis Chan's like, well, that's great, but you didn't actually do what I told you to do. Like, you loved me by showing that you not only heard what I said, by then, but by then actually doing it as well. Chan's point being that the way we act out what we know is just as important as what we know. But the Gnostics taught that it didn't actually matter. And so John has responded to them in this verse by saying that we should be walking in obedience to what God has said. Now, the final key thing that the Gnostics believed was that the material world was evil. And so they denied that Jesus Christ was actually human. Some claim that he only appeared to be human, but he wasn't really because God couldn't join to this evil material world. So John refutes this in verse 3 by saying that Jesus Christ was the Father's Son. So he was fully God. And then in verse 7, by saying that the key way that you can tell these false teachers from true teachers is that the false teachers don't acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. And by in the flesh, he's saying that coming as a man. See, the Gnostics attacked the nature of who Jesus was. So John refuted them. He does a lot in these 13 verses, doesn't he? Now, back to the purpose of this letter. See, these Gnostic teachers would go from church to church, and their teachings would cause confusion among the Christians inside the church. And some people who the Gnostics were teaching were starting to question whether they actually really knew who God was, whether they were experiencing eternal life, and whether they actually knew the truth. So imagine if we got someone here to speak, and they got up, and they started teaching that to be a Christian, to be a true Christian, what you had to do is go visit Jerusalem, or something like that. Now, if you're not sure in your faith, you'd start to question things. You'd like, start to question, well, am I actually a Christian? I haven't been to Jerusalem. Do I know anything at all? And that's what was happening. See, John is saying that these false teachers have the spirit of the Antichrist in them, the deceiver, that they are Antichrist, so they are anti-truth. Now, he's not saying that each one of them is the Antichrist, like the capital A Antichrist. I'll get to him in a second. But it's like he's saying that they have the spirit of the Antichrist in in them. In the same way that if you believe in Jesus Christ, you are called a Christian. You have the spirit of Christ in you, and that determines how you act. But you aren't actually Christ. Does that make sense? Now, as for the Antichrist, now John is the only one who uses that term, but he's called other things in the Bible, like Paul calls him the the man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians, and Daniel and Ezekiel call him the prince. And once again, Revelation study, we're starting to get into this stuff, so you're missing out if you're not there. But I want to explain some things to you guys, which I think is really cool. Okay? Now, we know about the Trinity in the Bible. There's the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, Revelation teaches us that in the end times, Satan will try to deceive people, so classic Satan, by mimicking this Trinity. That the equivalent to the Father will be Satan, the equivalent to the Son will be the Antichrist, and the equivalent to the Holy Spirit will be this guy called the Prophet of the Antichrist. And so the Antichrist will really try and deceive people. Like He'll really try and mimic Jesus to the extent that he'll look like he's been killed and then raised again. In, in the same way that Jesus said that his ministry was empowered by the Father, the Antichrist will have the power that comes from Satan. That the one who gives the Antichrist power is Satan. So Satan and the Antichrist are different. And if this stuff interests you, then come along to the Revelation studies. It's really cool. Now, Satan in the Bible is referred to as the deceiver of the whole world. Jesus calls him the father of lies, that all lies that we say to ourselves or um, that people say to us, all lies about God and Jesus, things like that, they come originally from him. And it's like a war and that Satan is the general. And John is saying that anyone who goes out saying that Jesus isn't from God has received the spirit of the Antichrist, the spirit of lies and deceptions, and that's come from Satan. Now, John absolutely loves this congregation that he's talking to, and he doesn't want them to be confused. He doesn't want them to be exposed to these lies. In the same way that, say, your friend got a boyfriend, and that boyfriend was really mean and demeaning to um, your friend. You'd want to stop the boyfriend from having access to your friend because he's filling her head with lies and he's deceiving her. And John feels the same way about his churches. So in verse 10, he tells them to not accept false teachers into their houses. 
Now, we need to remember that the churches in those days, they met in houses. And so when you accepted somebody into your house in those days, you were vouching for them. Like they were pretty much coming in to teach. Now, he's not saying that we shouldn't try and show them love, that we shouldn't try and point them back to the truth. Because, I mean, Jesus did that with all the people. He tells them that the commandment that we should be following is to love one another. But he's saying that the most loving thing that you can do is to not let these people teach because it will cause some people to lose sight of the truth. Now, as an aside, you know that our minister, Ian, is retiring at the end of the year, and I'm blessed to be on the committee to help try and find the new minister. And one of the key questions that, as a committee, we're asking those hopeful to fill the role is to try and explain to us the gospel or the good news of Jesus Christ. Because regardless of whether they are the greatest business person who's ever lived, regardless of whether they're the most charismatic speaker who has ever lived, if they can't answer the question about Jesus right, then they have the anti-Christ spirit in them. They are a deceiver and we should not welcome them into our church as a teacher or as a leader because they do not have the core truth about life right. Now you might say, okay, well that's all great, but here's one major assumption that John has made throughout the entire text and that is that he has the core truth about life right. You might be going like, I get what you're saying. What is important is that you don't let people teach lies. But how do you know that what you're saying is the truth? And that is an excellent question. Thank you for asking. And we're going to deal with this a bit more in the Train Equip Love session next Saturday morning. And once again, you're welcome to attend that. I'm really just up here plugging the last things, aren't I? (laughs) Now, this is one of the biggest obstacles that people have to Christianity. And I want to tackle it a little bit now. Now, Excuse me for getting a little bit philosophical here, but I think you guys are smart enough to handle it. Now, the argument against Christianity and against a lot of religions in general is that people say that there is no way that you can know the truth. They say that for you to say that you do know the truth is just a power play and it's arrogant. But like we said at the start, because like we said at the start, if you get someone to see what you're saying is truth, well, then you have the power to change the way in which they live their life. Now, can you see the problem with their argument already? They're saying that the truth is that no one can have the truth, but that makes their argument self-defeating because if no one can have the truth, then that includes them. So they can't say that the truth is that no one has the truth because that statement doesn't make sense. What they're really saying is that no one can know the truth except for them, and that's the biggest power play statement there is. So people make truth claims all the time. Now, a famous illustration that I've had used against me, you might have had it used against you as well, is one of an elephant with lots of blind people touching a certain aspect of the elephant. One blind man feels the tusk and says, an elephant is like a spear. Another feels the trunk and concludes, an elephant is like a snake. The blind man hugging the leg thinks, an elephant is like a tree. The one holding the tail claims, an elephant is like a rope. Another feeling the ear believes, an elephant is like a rug. And the last blind blind man leaning on the elephant's side exclaims, an elephant is like a wall. And the argument goes that this is what it's like with religion and truth, that you can't say that one is more true than the other because it depends on what the person is experiencing. Now, I'll make two remarks, which is how I often respond when people challenge me with this. First, for this argument to work, it implies that the person who is telling the illustration is the only one who can truly see the elephant, what the elephant is itself. And therefore, they know that everyone else is wrong. They're saying that everyone else is blind but them. And they're making a massive truth claim there. They're saying, I know everyone else is wrong because I can see the truth. I can see the elephant. But the whole point of their argument was that no one can know that it's an argument. So from that end, the argument doesn't hold up. And secondly, I would say that if you're trying to find out what an elephant is, all bets are off if the elephant opens its mouth and explains truly what it is itself. See, Christianity is the only religion in the world which says that God opened his mouth, that he came down into the world to tell us about himself. Now, think of it this way. If someone was going to write your story, then you'd want that person to know you pretty well. Okay? Or even better, the way that you'd get your story most told accurately was if you told it yourself. But all other religions have their truth claims, who they say God is and what they say God's will for your life is, coming through someone else. Like, for example, Muhammad for Islam or Buddha, Confucius. Only Christianity says that God himself came into the world as Jesus to declare to everyone what the truth from God is. And this is why the greatest question that I think has ever been asked comes from Mark chapter 8. And we studied it during our Mark series. Okay, Jesus is chatting with his disciples and he asks them the question, who do people say that I am? In other words, what are other people saying about me? Are they saying, like the Gnostics, that I'm not really God? 
And the disciples give him some answers. Some say John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the prophets, things like that. But then Jesus turns it on them. And here's the big question that every single person, I think, in the world needs to answer for themselves. See, Jesus asks them, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? Now, the reason that I say that every single person needs to ask that question themselves is because it's a question with huge significance. The answers are either that it's true, that Jesus is who he says he is, and therefore we should follow what he says, including that he is the way, that he is the truth, that he is the life, and that the only way through heaven to heaven is by believing in him. Or it's not true. And like the Apostle, says, the Apostle Paul says, we're wasting our time here on a Sunday night, and we're to be pitied more than any other creature. So I want to finish by sharing a bit of my story and how important truth was for me. Now, most of you guys know that during my teenage years, I wasn't a Christian. And perhaps it was only my strongly atheist dad becoming a Christian just before he died that sort of got me into thinking, well, perhaps I should look into it. Because I saw my dad, who had lived his entire life as though something were true, change and then start believing that something else was true. So can you see the importance of truth, not just for yourself, but for other people as well? So I started looking for myself, and I started with the basic premise that if there was a God, then he'd make himself known in some way. Now notice, I didn't just say, I didn't just start with Christianity, even though that was what my dad started to follow, and even though that had been what my mum had followed her entire life. I said, I'll look into everything. I'll research as far and wide as I can in search of the truth. So I looked at what different religions said what truth they offered. And I watched debates between Christians and atheists, between Muslims and Hindus, each of them saying that they had the truth about the truth. And I couldn't just say, like some people do say, that, oh, well, it doesn't really matter. They all pretty much teach the same thing. Because if you spend more than five minutes looking into it, you realize that that's not really an intellectually valid thing to say. Now, there were some things that almost everyone agreed on, some common ground, if you will. And one of those bits of common ground was that there's something wrong with the world and we have a part to play in that, that bad things happen to us and bad things happen by us. And I think if you're going to start seeking the truth, then you need to look at yourself first to begin with as well. And I don't think anybody here is going to be bold enough to stand up and say that they're perfect, that there's nothing wrong with them whatsoever. So that was the common ground, but the question was always, well, how do we deal with that? Like, what's the truth about how we deal with the bad things in this world? How do we find our purpose? And an atheist will say that the truth is, well, we're here by accident. Life has no meaning but what you give it. Your feelings determine whether or not you're a good person or what other people think of you. That's how you cancel out the bad things inside of you. Think that you're doing good things or get other people to validate that you're doing good things. In which case, you'll spend your entire life looking for approval from others and yourself. And who's harder on you than yourself? Or someone like a Muslim will say that the truth is, well, you need to do things that God approves of. That's the way your life gains meaning, and that's how you fix the bad things inside of you. So they pray five times a day. They make a trip to Mecca, things like that. Buddhism, try and work off your karma. It goes on. In other words, if you want to be loved, then you, if you want the bad things in your life to not be the things that define who you are, then you'd better do good things first. Your worth is determined by what you do. Now, Christianity says that the truth is different. Christianity says that the truth is that we are flawed and we're so deeply flawed that we cannot fix it. But it says that that's not the whole truth. It says that the whole truth is that even though we are deeply flawed, we are more deeply loved than we ever thought possible. And this love is not based on what we do. See, the love of God is an initiating love. God initiates it from his end. He starts the love. In every other religion, in every other worldview, love is something that you earn. You do good works and then you are loved. But Christianity flips this. Christianity says that you are loved first, as shown by Jesus on the cross, and then you are free because of this, to do good works. The motivating factor for the good works in your life isn't some sort of, well, I'm trying to make up for the bad things in my life. I'm trying to fix myself. Because Christianity says it's already been made up for. So there shouldn't be any performance anxiety for the Christian. Christianity leaves you free to love because you've been loved first. And that's why John, in this letter, can point back to the commandment that they had from the beginning, to love one another. Because love received is love extended. We, can, we receive love first so we can freely extend it to others. And that's why one of the key reasons that Christianity, and I mean true Christianity, was appealing to me. See, Christianity is the most liberating worldview there is because it says that the truth is that you are loved, warts and all, 
because God made you. And nothing that you can do can change the fact that God loves you and God made you. See, unconditional grace, unconditional love is the truth of Christianity for those willing to accept it. And that is why John is so against the false teachers. Now, you might think that he's being harsh in this letter, but it's because the stakes are so high. See, the stakes are the truth, and the truth can either be liberating like Christianity or it can be restrictive like all other religions. So my key take-home message from tonight is for everyone to look into the truth for yourself because like John's heart for this letter was, for the people inside this church, I don't want people to be deceived. See, John wanted the people in his church to live by the truth, and that's my heart for you guys to look into the truth and live by that. And that's why we run all these ministries as well. We want to help you see what the truth is. And I can say that with full confidence because truth cannot contradict truth. Now, we celebrated Easter recently, and it ends with the empty tomb. The stone was rolled away from the front of the empty tomb. Now, have you ever asked yourself the question, why was the stone rolled away? Was it because Jesus couldn't get out? Like, was he sitting there going, oh, well, I'm alive again, but I'm going to be dead again soon because I forgot to account for this freaking rock. (laughs) Jesus wouldn't say freaking, but... (laughs) We see him walk through a locked door a few verses later. Like, clearly that wasn't the reason. So why was the stone rolled away? The reason the stone was rolled away was not so that Jesus could get out, but so that we could get in. See, Jesus is inviting you and he's inviting me to to peer in, to see. Jesus is saying to the world, come in, take a look. You've got doubts? I can handle it. You've got questions? Bring them. Come and find the truth, because Jesus says that he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And Jesus said that he came into this world so that we can have life and have it to the full. And he did this by removing the punishment for our sins by dying on the cross for us. So I want to finish with this verse. This is what he said to John, the guy who wrote this book, and to all the other disciples. This is what he said in the Gospel of John in chapter 8. And I want you to leave here tonight with this verse running through your head. So this is what he said to them, and this is what he says to all of us. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you that you sent Jesus in the world, into the world so that he could speak to us. The, the elephant has opened its mouth, if you will, and it's told us, who we are. It's told us the truth about who we are, and that truth is that we are deeply loved by you. And so I pray that everyone here will seek the truth, seek the truth. And I say that because I strongly, with all my heart, I believe that when they seek the truth, they will end up with you, Lord. You are the way, you are the truth, you are the life. And so I pray for all those people who yeah, have doubts. I just thank you for the doubts because the doubts can lead into um, deeper searching. But I pray that, yeah, they'll use those doubts to look deeper and deeper into what it actually means to be a follower of you. You are the most liberating um, thing in the world, Lord. You liberate us from all feelings that we need to prove ourselves to other people, that we need to do something to, to be loved because you show us that we are deeply loved and that is not something that can be changed. You love us uh, not because of who, you, who we think we're going to become. You love us right now. And so, Heavenly Father, I just pray that everybody here will look into the truth and look into the love that you've shown us. I pray all these things in your name. Amen.